Reminder to sign the book for your saving credits and grad students for your attendance. And today we have a very special presentation by uh, Dr. Tim Solis and two colleagues from John Hopkins Hospital, Dr. James Burke and Dr. Zalmi Sun. They're going to be presenting to you on the origin and future evolution of the bound classification, tissue engineering pathology, and reverse chimerism. And there's a long-term history with Dr. Solis and Dr. Burke. They've been working together since the 1980s. I continue to enjoy very active collaborations with some very recent publications. And I know that it's directly tied into work that they're doing with the NIH grant that uh, is uh, with Dr. Zalison. So with that, I would like to invite Paul Vargas. Oh, next week, a reminder, we have Dr. Nick Dayton presenting. that you could have lymphocytes and a non-rejecting graft that, that just seemed uh, not right at all. So we started doing protocol um, biopsies and we probably had the best and most organized protocol biopsy study in those years in the 1980s. So that eight year period between uh, January 1983 and the time of the BAMF meeting in August of 1991 was, was, was a period where we generated a great deal of data and uh, uh, experience in transplant biopsies, without which we, we certainly could not have created the BAMF classification. Um, so if, if any of you want to find those papers, it's very easy because there's a kind of nihilism among some people thinking that we made all this stuff up, that we pulled the, you know, the information out of the air without data. So over and over again, in anything that I've written about the history of the BAMP classification, you always find Dr. Burdick's papers front and center there, not only just, just like the the reference, but like the whole summary of what they showed, because I, I wanted people to know that we didn't just make all this stuff up in 1991, that we had, had uh, been working in that area for eight years previously. Future evolution, you know, I'm very much about the future. There are two courses in the world in a medical school talking about She's becoming smarter than we are. First in individual humans have become smarter than individual humans in 2029 and smarter than the whole human race in 2045. I believe that should be taught in every medical school, but it happens that there, the, the only two courses that teach that, one is in Budapest, uh, Hungary, and the other is here. And that's a very important part of my life. Most of my you know, discussions are related to that. Most of my contact with students ha has to do with those um, overarching big picture 
uh, futuristic thoughts about where human society is, is, is going and what the world will be like as uh, technology evolves. So you will get that flavor today, even though we, we, we are in the presence of, of, of uh, Dr. Burdick, who, who, who really helped me start my uh, uh, career in terms of Banff. Just before I get into my presentation, um, some of you may know that in the journal Transportation, last month there was an interview with me. It's quite a broad-ranging interview. And if you already find me a bit boring, you really hate this article because it's like everything about me. It's not just, you know, the, the transplantation part of me, but the international disaster relief part of me, and the poetry and music part of me, and the cyber nephrology office part of me with art and art artifacts all, all over. So it's all in there. And I don't know if you've ever thought of the managing editor of journals and the managing editing team, but these are a very powerful force in our scientific lives, and often they're people you never meet. They're just names on a page. But in this instance, so if you look in row four, these significant three ladies on the end of row four, that is the managing editorial team for the journal Transplantation. And they actually made that article about me happen. And it was kind of life-changing in some interesting ways. I, I won't uh, go into the details. My father's 94. And you know, you, 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 you think about the talk that you have with your parents. You, usually it's like the age of you know, 11 or 12, and there's only one talk, right? That's it. That's the talk. But recently, I sent this uh, interview with me to my father, a large type version, so he could easily read it. And he decided that something you know, significant information he kept from me for my entire life, I was now ready to receive based, based on this art article. The other thing is, the article uh, changed some of the medical leaders' opinions about me locally because there's just things in there that they never knew that I had done or I had an interest in. So suddenly, very important people started stopping me in the hall and talking to me about things that they just never knew that I had any interest in before that art article. So I want to thank the three, three of you. I, I know you're kind of stealth people. You don't like the spotlight shining, shining on, on you. But anyway, I am very grateful to you. And it's been wonderful having you visit us today. So I don't have any conflicts. Um, so regenerative medicine, we're going to talk about that a lot. And it's an area that is the greatest promise for the future of medicine. It is also where the greatest intellectual dishonesty, fraud, uh, stem cell tourism, uh, uh, and stem cell hype, all, all that. So you, you, you have to sort of keep all those conflicting ideas in your head. And this is, in fact, one of the origins of this uh, initiative that we have called the Future and All That Jazz, where we insert important scientific ideas into music and poetry that people would never sit still to listen to a lecture on. If you advertise such a lecture, they suddenly discover they have to wash their hair or something important <laughs> conflicting, and they can't go to the lecture. But if you entertain them with poetry and music, you can get them to think about the same things. So what is the evidence that you need to think about regenerative medicine? As many of you know, um, the Canadian Society of Transplantation Meeting this year was joint with CTRMS, which is a regenerative medicine organization. And it worked very well. Nobody complained. Nobody said, well, the world is not ready for this. I'm not going. No, I, it, it, it was a, a wonderfully interactive meeting. And that is the way meetings will be in the future. Uh, and 
the meetings that I'm in charge of, the BAMF meetings, the next one, in every BAMF meeting, one of the most important days is the first day where we have a day-long symposium on something. And in 2019, it's going to be on regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, pathology. So those of you thinking that you don't have to bother with regenerative medicine and you can avoid it, I'm telling you, resistance is futile. There's no escape. You're, you, you have to face this. So the future and all that jazz are just a few days away from the first ever major scientific meeting where we're actually doing this. So there is a team of uh, four poets, four musicians and me and all our musical in instruments and associated amps and preamps and all that kind of stuff. Uh, drum sets, cymbals, you can imagine. So I, we, this is all organized now and we know where all the, the different components are going to come from. I just finalized the last uh, contract for getting stuff for us. Uh, for this, and so both performances will happen. The first is in an exhibit area, where if you look on the program, the all, there's only one thing to do at that time. It says review posters in the exhibit area. That's it. And it's a two hour period, so we are going to perform uh, our music and poetry during that two hour period in the exhibit area. I've thought of various ways to keep people quiet and you know, attentive. We'll see how it goes. There's a lot of, on the line. I've been talking about this for a long time, but this is really the kind of acid test for whether we can make this happen. And then the next day, the largest performance venue in Charlotte is the NASCAR Hall of Tame. Hall of Fame, which has uh, you know race cars and stuff and a racetrack inside, and we're performing there in a 27,000 uh, square feet uh, space, and we have a sound system that adequately handles that. And I've learned a lot <laughs> sound systems the last 36 hours, and um, yeah, so so it it's. Uh, you might say, well, that's not science. I, I'm telling you, there are areas of science that, that are going to be stuck unless we do things like this. Because you can all feel resistance to new ideas. And it's one thing, if it's a new idea that seems entirely positive, then maybe you can accept getting into something new that you haven't thought about before. But as soon as you know that it's got big negatives too, and that it's very complicated, and it's political, and all these kinds of things, then you might actually opt to try not to think about it. So we're trying to counter that. So why is regenerative medicine important in transplantation? Probably most of you are uh, interested in transplantation, or you might not have come to this talk, probably the empty seats of people not interested in transplantation, and then there's you. So what is the success of uh, transplantation? If you were to kind of give a concise description, we're providing organs only to 10% of the people who require them. And most people die waiting. I mean, that, that's the simple an answer. I know that it's, it's a wonderful advance. I'm proud to be part of it. But it could be tenfold or more better where we are providing organs to everybody who needs an organ. That's what stem cell generated organs, stem cell repair, um, regenerative medicine, tissue engineering. That's the promise that it could provide. And it could do a lot more than that. It's not just transplantation. It's whatever is your area of greatest interest. Regenerative medicine could also provide remarkable benefits there. So worldwide, 1.2 million people are in need of transplantation on stage or in failure <coughs> each year, and we reach only 10% of that number. So regenerative medicine can save the remaining 90%. So I realize I left out a slide here. 
I always have, and that is Ben Adams' um, reaction to what Banff is. And, and uh, so I, I didn't realize he'd be sitting here in the first row and took that slide, slide up. But I think people get bored just hearing me talk about Banff because I've been doing Banff for 26 years and it can be kind of uh, like I'm in my own little world when, when, when I, I'm uh, talking about Banff. Um, so what Bennett said is using the Banff scoring provides a sort of imprimatur that you really know what you're doing looking at transplant kidneys. That as soon as you begin to utter that GITV stuff, that people really know that you know what you're doing. So anyway, that's a, that's a young person just starting his faculty career, his, his view of Banff. Um, so it's a histologic uh, classification of all uh, uh, conditions that you can find in the transplanted kidney, and these are many of the milestones. Uh, and uh, it was uh, something without structure at, at all until 2013. So Lorraine Rackison and I started this together in 91, and was sort of uh, was our benign guiding hand that kept it going all, all that time. But if, if you think about the modern world, you really can't have something that has no there there, right? It has to have some substance that has to be something. So in 2013, we created a nonprofit Swiss foundation, the Banff Foundation for Allograph Pathology. So I'm the chair of that. You can be the chair for two three-year terms. So my term is up in 2019, and Michael Mangle will take over from me then. We plan ahead very far. We were just talking today about the 2025 meeting. I mean, we know exactly where all the meetings before that are, but 2025, we just decided, would be in Asia. It must be, because so many people from Asia have been coming to our meetings, it's only fair that 2025 be in Asia. Dr. Sun uh, proposed an hour ago that it be in China. I think it's a very good idea. So I, I, I suspect that you're the first audience to hear that the 2025 BAMP meeting will be in China. And uh, so it's kind of exciting to be able to plan ahead like that. Um, 2021, you'll recognize that will be the 30th year of BAMP, and it's going to be in BAMP, Alberta, Canada. And I think we can do special things for that very special meeting. And so if you can think of something, you know, some important speaker who's never been to Banff that you'd like to see there, let us know, because we're thinking of, of how to make that 30-year uh, anniversary meeting really something very special. OK. Um, so you may know that this institution here at the University of Alberta is the sixth ranked institution in terms of transplantation research. So how do you think those rankings work? Do you think that like they send people to every university, have them stay for six months, and uh, talk to people, interview people, and assess the quality of transplantation science in every university in the world? Nah, they don't do that. They just look at literature citations, right? So we are the sixth best in the world in terms of literature citations in transplantation. And the BAMF process is the major reason for that. And that's quite interesting to us in laboratory medicine. Even though there are many firsts, there is, as you'd be aware, the Edmonton Protocol and all sorts of firsts in cert surgery in terms of kidney and heart transplantation and so on. There are many exciting things that have taken place here outside of laboratory medicine. But the vast majority of the literature citations that make us the sixth best place in, in transplantation in the world come from 
the Banff classification. So uh, there are more than 10,000 literature uh, uh, citations associated with Banff. And if you check anything else that you know, you'll find it's probably in the, the hundreds, not the thousands. And it will get better. Because that, we've, we've just had the first uh, full-length article on tissue engineering BAMP classification accepted by AJT. And um, so there, there will be more publications now because it, it's, we're, we're now talking about two different classifications. We have the existing one, we have the new one. They'll be concurrent for a long period of time. And maybe at some point we won't be doing allographs anymore. Because we'll have something better, perhaps. Um, so th this is Michael Mangold's diagram of how the BAMF process works. Um, when Michael and I first talked about BAMF, I, I remember that very well. I sort of just discovered kind of the full um, power of BAMF and what, what it had done. And came to see me and said, I want to talk to you about Banff. Everything about Banff. <laughs> okay. So, so anyway, it's nice, nice, it, it's, it's nice to be working with uh, somebody who's uh, enthusiastic. Michael is very enthusiastic about this. These are some pictures of Banff over, over the years. This is the building where we began, the uh, Trans Canada <coughs> Pipeline Pavilion. Um, this is the latest meeting, and at that latest meeting, we talked about the status of uh, tissue engineering pathology, regenerative medicine, with all the individual organ shares for bands, heart, lung, liver, kidney, composite, tissue graph. We told them all that permanently now, their job has something added to it, that they are now responsible for making the regenerative medicine pathology part of, of, of the organ that they, they are in charge of, a part of future BAMF meetings. So, so that would be very much a part of our agenda for ever in the future. Many of you who read the AJT can probably remember how you felt when you saw this cover. And you may have thought that it was premature, that you know that we're not really there yet. You can't really make hearts or any other or organ. And so, what's that all all about? And so, this cover, I think, was an important part of the medical politics in this area because there were discussions all over the world about whether that was an appropriate cover. And I think it was that by 2014 it made sense to do do this uh, and um, so that that the the world is changing rapidly we, we need to think about these sorts of things uh, matrix becomes very important uh, you know that recreating embryology but making it quicker right you don't want it to take uh, 18 years to, to, to make an adult organ, you need to, to, to be able to generate. This. So it's not really embryology in the same time course, but a lot of the same concepts apply. You, you, you'd like to be using stem cells to make normal organs and, and uh, organs that, that, that will function. And so you, you may think, like, looking at this, that it requires a lot of new knowledge, but it also requires the things that all of you learned in school that you probably now regard as completely worthless information now. And now with regenerative medicine, it's coming back again. If you think of old-fashioned concepts like the stunned myocardium, the intact nephron hypothesis, we don't talk about those things anymore. They have no relevance to modern medicine. But with some of the abnormalities that you get in a decellularized, recellularized organ, those exact questions come up. You know, what determines which 
nephrons are filtrating which ones are and all, all that kind of stuff and, and you know what determines the strength of uh, contractility in the heart it's really easy in the heart decellularize recellularize the heart and then it has a very weak beat well you don't want a heart with a very weak beat that's, a, that's not a good outcome so what's what's the reason you know so so a lot of really uh, simple concepts of uh, physiology that you were forced to learn at one time for a test and you've probably thought now just don't count for anything in the modern world. Begin to count again as we all come together to make this uh, regenerative medicine stuff work. I keep asking about this jump-starting slide. I'm prepared to remove it when my audience will start telling me that, that we don't need it anymore. But I think that we definitely do. Um, and and uh, people really resist this. Uh, and if you want some evidence, you may know that there was the first ever um, Kidney Health Summit. The ISN put together a Kidney Health Summit. It, like all important things, it was published in multiple high-profile journals at the same time it was in The Lancet and KI and so on. And you can just search the terms. It's all electronic. It's all searchable. And you can find that regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, repair, um, uh, artificial organs, a whole lot of things that you would think would have to be in that article that aren't. Even though some of the authors are in the forefront of, like, you know, regenerative medicine science. And so it must be that some of them wish to have those subjects in there, and they were overruled. And then if you look at the conflicts of interest of this large group of authors, of medical leaders in kidney medicine worldwide, the, 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 the most famous people that probably most of you know, um, their pharma connections are all, you know, traditional pharma. And, and I think there was probably strong influence that don't <laughs> write about this stuff. Uh, there, there, there's enough in the area that pharma is currently supporting, you know, research on, on this area that you can talk about that, but don't talk about the areas that are outside the areas of interest of your supporting pharma companies. And uh, the, there's just no question about it, that, 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 that there are a substantial number of things that must be the future of kidney health on a global scale that are absolutely left out of every article. So this was a summit with multiple articles. And there's nothing about those things in any of the outcome articles from that. So lest you think politics <laughs> plays no role, I can tell you, you know, they're, they're, it does. So, so these are some of the things that we need to start thinking about. And is Canada ready for this? Does the Canadian public want this? Yes. There's evidence that the average Canadian voter and taxpayer likes the idea of radical life extension and regenerative medicine. So uh, the country needs you to help make regenerative medicine happen. Everybody can take part in this. And this is not something for a different group of people over there. <coughs> And that's, that's one of the fears that I have that you can actually see play out in the American Society of Transplantation. They have communities of practice. There's a community of practice in regenerative medicine with very few people in it. So you may find that I'm part of the leadership of that. Well, everybody who's a part of that is part of the leadership. There's almost nobody else except the leaders. Some of the meetings have two people, some have three. So that's not the way this should go. Everybody has a stake in this, and it's a part of what you've already been doing. It's a logical extension of the things you've already been doing. 
And it is within medicine kind of the analog of the technological sing singularity, which I talked about er earlier, is that point in time when machines are smarter than we are. Uh, technological advance accelerates very quickly. We can under only understand what's going on in the world if we collaborate or merge or cooperate with uh, sentient machines in some way. So <laughs> that may be hard to wrap, wrap your head around, but something closer to home is that regenerative medicine is kind of the medical part of this. So what, what do decellularized, recellularized organs look like? Um, first of all, it, it's hard to get a situation where you do that and get an interesting result at, at the end. So Harold Ott, who runs the lab, this work comes from, this is from a study by Song et al. in 2013, describes exploding kidneys, you know, trying to infuse with the proper pressure to get enough cells in. And a lot of the kidneys simply explode. And a few don't, and, and, and you end up with a large number of cells in there, and then you can see what they do. But it's very hard to make it a reproducible procedure. It isn't. It, it still sort of catches, catch can in, in terms of getting the cells in there. So what do you see here? There's a tubule with multiple interconnecting lumens. There is an interstitium very devoid of cells. There should be more cells there. There's a glomerulus here with two fused cells. And so people who are skeptical about regenerative medicine say, well, can you call this a kidney? Well, of course you can call it kidney. It has tubules, glomeruli, you know, what else? Yeah, so of course it is. And it's not that you should criticize it and say it's not a kidney. You should figure out how can we make it better? How, how can we make the process of putting the cells in better? How, you know. So um, the other thing that's sort of interesting is the podocytes, which are ordinarily only on the outer aspect of the glomerular and capillaries and nowhere else in the kidney, <coughs> in this scenario, they get out into the interstitium and they start wandering around. So this is in the rat. So the question is whether that happens in people too. So Aspic Petrocyan, who's kind of a young person, the world's expert in intracellular, sorry, extracellular matrix in the kidney. Um, she um, has been doing studies that's entirely human. You take stem cells from human amniotic fluid and you infuse them into basically discarded human kidneys that, that cannot be used for transplantation and have been decellularized. And then you let them incubate for, for a while, up to six weeks, eight weeks, and you see what you have. So it's sort of similar to that phenomenon of podocytes wandering in the interstitium. Those don't look like podocytes. <laughs> That's a very primitive big cells. So like we, we ask in the paper, we say, we're not sure if these have you know, differentiated into podocytes yet. Well, obviously they haven't. Uh, but they, maybe they have some beginning characteristics. Of, some, some of them are in the right place for where photocytes should be, but others of them, just like in, in the rat, are wandering around within the interstitium. And thinking back to the poetry and music <laughs> side of things, I mean, if you think of poetry in motion, what does that make you think about? makes you think about maybe watching somebody of the opposite sex. But I think poetry in motion in the future is, is going to be stuff like this. Uh, what are those cells actually doing? Are they dangerous? Are, are they headed in the right direction if you let them incubate for a few more months? Will, will they turn into something useful and know the right places to go? Or will they create a Teratoma, you know, so, so there are lots of interesting
questions. They, they look like not only do they have the wisdom of the ages, <laughs> like a, but you say, well, every cell has the wisdom of the ages in its uh, DNA. Yeah, but most of it's turned off. These look like most <laughs> things are turned on. They're sort of ready to do anything. And you sort of get the feeling of a great, you know, dynamism here. What's going to happen next? So I, I, I find this a very exciting picture. I hope you do too. It's the only author-generated picture in this article we have coming out. And it was a big flaw before that we didn't have anything like this. And now we have this picture. So, so it's very important to us. And I hope it stimulates your thinking. So where are we? Are we at sort of the tag end of human evolution that humans are going down the tubes and you know that, that, that um, it's not much of a future for us. I sort of hold with what these authors are saying that we're really still at the very beginning. Humans have a long future, I, I think. And so we're at the very beginning of the time for the human race, uh, Richard Feynman said. Um, not unreasonably grappled with problems of tens of thousands of years in the future. Anyway, I, I, I believe in that. And that the sense of the future is behind all the good policies. And to a large extent, the future lies before us. Vast wilderness of unexplored reality. It's been a lot of excitement about the future for a long time. You know, the International classification of diseases began in 1851. It began in this building, the first ever uh, all glass lined large building, London's Crystal Palace. You may know that it burned down and they're now recreating it. I think it will open again in uh, 2018, London's Crystal Palace. So, what was that classification of diseases like? It was very much oriented around death, cause of death, time of death, character of death, 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 death. Everything about this classification was about death. So I think what I see in the terms of the new BAM classification of uh, tissue engineering pathology is, is uh, the opposite of that. We're, we're sort of oriented around life. What characteristics do Stem cell generated organs, stem cell repaired organs need to have in, in order to be useful to the patient. Um, so the, you can imagine various ways that this classification can be uh, uh, put together. Interestingly, to you, you know, the modern publication process. So this paper was accepted on U.S. Thanks. Giving Day, which was just exactly a week ago today on the 23rd. And uh, it will be online in full text about five days from now. So it's not like I need to go through all the details. You can all, if, if you're interested, just go into the AJT website and see it. And then you can see the paper evolve. You can see you know, the editing process, you'll find out that the other pictures are all meant to be drawn by an artist employed by the journal. <laughs> and so we provided a you know, pencil sketch of what we want the artists to do. So that, that will be an exciting part. So the first online version of the article will still have the pencil sketches, but at some point when the artist gets done, will be replaced by them. And, and the whole thing will sort of evolve. So in the past, when you talk to somebody who recently had an article accepted, it might be months before you could actually look at it. But the world is different. Um, so you can think about things are there too, mis too many missing cells, distorted structures, uh, too many cells in the wrong places. Is the organ structurally intact enough to function safely and adequately in, in, in the recipient? And are there missing distorted structural elements that represent a risk to the patient? So a very long time ago, in the 1970s, there was an article by Klaus 
Turau on acute renal, renal success. What he said was that the decreased urine output in acute tubular injury saves a patient's life because otherwise it would be a concentrating defect and they would pee out their entire body water within a few hours and die. So that oliguria saves the patient's life. I'm not sure most people believe that. But the, the question is, it, do we need long loops of handling? Do, do these kidneys, these stem cell generated kidneys, need to be able to concentrate the urine? Because that is tough. Because when you make stem cell generated organs, they tend to make shortcuts. And so the, um, the stem cell generated kidney would like to have short loops of Henle entirely and leave out the whole concentration pathway. So what's interesting, Harold Ott, if you listen to the, the uh, we uh, had him speak in the course that I had given. We took sort of the best uh, six or eight minutes of that. And what he talks about is the regenerative medicine organ as a device. Think of it as a physical device. And what do you want that device to do? What features should it have? Probably you can't pick everything that the normal kidney does or a normal other organ does because that's going to be decades before we can produce those kinds of perfect stem cell generated organs. So maybe a kidney that can filter waste just great but can't concentrate the urine, maybe that's just fine. So that, that's another way of thinking about that. Um, there has been tissue engineering pathology for a long time. Um, and it's just begun to be interesting now. Many of you know the biocide trial going on in the, this uh, hospital with uh, James uh, Shapiro as the PI. So they're starting to be actual regenerative medicine constructs. That, that's a, a, an, an, an an encapsulated um, uh, transplant of pancreatic progenitor cells for type 1 uh, diabetic patients. And so it's starting to get interesting. It isn't that it has not existed before. There really was tissue engineering pathology before I coined the term. It just wasn't really interesting or, or, or exciting enough, and now it so this is a clue to Sliba. We presented this in an eye poster. I don't know if you know about eye posters. Basically, no limit to how much material you can put in it. You can put in lengthy videos, as many videos as you want. It's on and it's there forever. Uh, so you can, you can still look at our poster. But things became much more complicated when we presented that eye poster because uh, Estic Petrosyan had been waiting for us. <laughs> so we walk into the room, approach our poster, and she, I want to talk to you. And she wanted to tell us how extremely complicated the extracellular matrix is. This is something she uniquely knows about. And um, I, I'm sure that she is right. And so there are so many choices. There are thousands and thousands of choices of ways in which you might put together uh, stem cells generated or regenerative medicine, uh, bioengineered kidney, or any other organ. And so it really brings together my two interests. You know, the, the future knowledge jazz that I've been talk, talking about, it addresses two areas of science where most people would not voluntarily subject themselves to a lecture. They would want to do something else. One is artificial intelligence safety, and the other is regenerative medicine. So here that kind of brings it together, because indeed there are so many options that you need computers to tell you what kind of matrix and mediators and all these sorts of things. There's so many choices of ways to put in cells and other ways of treating the organ at the same time. So it's going to involve both artificial intelligence and uh, regenerative medicine.
medicine at the same time. This is her um, diagram of the great rich complexity of the extracellular matrix. So originally in Banff, 26 years ago, we had mule deer poking their heads in, into the meeting rooms. And the other thing we had is uh, children. Children came to those meetings. And when the mule deer <laughs> poked the bed in, look, Daddy, you know, we don't really have that anymore. There's no mule deer anymore. There's no children in our meetings. Um, so we, we've uh, come a long way. Um, but if we want to stop at this point, it would be very disappointing. So Dr. Burdick is now going to talk about these uh, final slides. Thanks, Kim. Uh, thank you and um, the organizers for this course of bringing um, Charlie's son and myself here. And I also want to thank Dr. Sun for letting me do this uh, part of it. Um, <clears throat> I've recently become involved with, with him and his lab, um, and am particularly enthusiastic about the kinds of things uh, that I can see we can think about for the future. Um, but uh, this is the this is really Dr. Sun's work, along with the excellent group of um, uh, uh, students and the people mentoring. Um, and um, I think that one of the reasons this is appealing to me is that it. It's part of a, a long historical uh, chain of events that I, since we're talking about history today a little bit, um, as a transplant surgeon, I view the world through uh, the field of transplantation. And I, I think that much of what we know about biology now has been partially supported or hastened or the knowledge has been uh, more quickly available, uh, made more quickly available by the drive to get an organ to survive in the patient. Um, obviously, the whole issue of uh, what HLA antigen is and the T cell receptor and where, where uh, different strains fit in uh, to that uh, fascinating and very neat immunological phenomenon, pathways, the uh, TOR, mTOR, and yeast target of rapamycin, the um, the whole um, calcineurin pathway, activation induced cell death, a lot of that is important in all sorts of ways, but one of the things supporting a lot, driving a lot of that research was trying to just make the transplant work. And what I'm going to talk about for just a very few minutes is really uh, goes along as another extension of, of that sort of uh, principle. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start by just um, reviewing the sort of underlying um, principle uh, that um, you heard about uh, those that Dr. Sun presented yesterday. Um, and to, just in brief, um, what he has found and demonstrated in several different ways. Um, given early limited rejection, stem cell mobilization, and uptake by graft tissue, plus probably Tregs, being involved, produces graft chimerism. And that allograft chimerism produces tolerance for the graft. And that, as he described, is very powerful. You, weeks to months in the case of a rat and years in the case of a pig, no immunosuppression, the allograft is surviving. Quite remarkable. And I think it's very promising. And um, it's I've given it the title of the special stem cell chimeric organ theory. So that's, it's, it's beyond this theory, it's an established principle, perhaps. One thing they came up with as they were doing this work was uh, looking at, let's say, uh, rats early after uh, an organ had been implanted and you would uh, sacrifice them and uh, remove the kidneys for histology and so forth. Um, and as you remember, they, there were a lot of control saline and individual drugs, but the joint combination of AMD and FK506 was the only thing that would give prolonged graft survival. But interestingly, those animals at one or two weeks when you were, for the experimental purposes, opening the incision <coughs> to look at the allograft, the wounds were a lot better healed in the animals that had gotten the combination therapy. Now, I don't know if that was exactly what triggered it, but um, this 
really means that um, a series of experiments that I'm going to um, attempt to show you here. Um, uh, has, has really extended the field of the stem cell mobilization process beyond uh, use of algorithms. One great experiment I show you here, um, it's skin wounds created in mice. Um, and uh, the result as healing process proceeds is compared in this case with just a normal skin biopsy and then the controls, and this is the combination therapy. And you can't tell too much, but it turns out that by massive trichome, there's a whole lot of fibrosis and scar tissue, and essentially these, these wounds heal as you would expect, a five centimeter wound without any coverage, just from treatment for letting it heal. Um, they form scar tissue. But with the combination therapy, here you are, no fibrosis, minimal fibrosis, uh, hair follicles, and um, by 15 days, <clears throat> instead of an irregular thin scar tissue, it's good solid skin with hair growth, and if you're not convinced by this, this is the microscopic uh, count of the, um, uh, of the uh, hair follicles, and um, the, there are very few in the scar tissue, but with the combination treatment, the wound heals not only 25% faster, but much more normal. Um, and stem cells are involved, and the stem cells, um, uh, as, as seen in, in this uh, example, seem to be working uh, together to form the, um, uh, the um, normal tissue when, when the therapy is, um, uh, is, is done with the double drugs as opposed to the controls. So, um, this has been carried further um, with the next experiment, pharmacological mobilization of endogenous bone marrow stem cells. That's the combination treatment. Promotes liver regeneration. Now this is 85, this has nothing to do with an allograft. This is 85% uh, hepatectomy. <coughs> and um, then the rats uh, do regenerate their livers. It's a survival, barely a survival experiment, but the saline controls do live. But you can see early on, it's very clear that the albumin um, of, in the animal is much better if it has been treated with the combination therapy. And again, it's possible to demonstrate that both um, stem cell presence um, in the uh, O6 hepatic cell, oval cell precursors, um, the, the, the stem cells are involved in this and um, that the um, degree of um, proliferation by KI7 um, is, is much, um, much greater in the O6 cells in the uh, A of combo treatment. So again, we're not talking about allograft projection, we're just talking about wound healing. And this is um, data presented by uh, Dr. Melissa Chen, a resident in surgery who was um, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Sun's lab. And it's very simple. Uh, she did colon resection and anastomosis, a little resection of colon and anastomosis in rats. And um, the, the rats with saline control uh, treatment had, began to heal. Uh, this is, I think is five days. Oops. Um, and, but, but look at the AF combination. Histo histologically, you can tell that this is way ahead of the uh, controls. And um, they also did bursting pressures, just took the sections out and put um, saline under pressure in. And you can see that in the controls, the uh, strength of the colon was rather weak, but um, with AF combination, um, this is actually statistically indistinguishable from native colon, and it's much different than any of the controls. So the AF combination gives you very good healing of this colon anastomosis, which is a very stringent test of how uh, well uh, this um, new uh, novel drug, if you will, or novel pharmacological approach uh, can, can work. Um, so 
this, these are three different ways in which uh, we think that this is uh, very important as a general phenomenon. Um, this is a little more theoretical because I can't cite a hundred different, um, let's say, settings of trauma or whatever uh, in which it works, but um, it's, it's certainly a very good start towards the Sun Williams stem cell hypothesis yeah, as a general uh, approach. And uh, Dr. Sun mentioned Dr. Williams yesterday, but he, he's been a very important guiding light in the whole process of, of developing this um, combination therapy along with Xiaobi. So I'll state that for any inflammation or other cellular damage, including but not limited to rejection, stem cell mobilization and wound uptake produces faster, more normal healing. So I have um, whimsically called that the general stem cell mobilization theory without um, protesting any allusion to any other general and special theories. But um, I, it, uh, this is a whole new thing that's grown out just like the T cell receptor or uh, torus uh, mechanism or uh, all of the other things that have stem partly from transplantation. Here's another new thing that stem from transplantation, and I'm going to show you one other uh, snazzy thing. Uh, because I think this is this whole field of how to do things with stem cells, as Kim said, there's been a lot of charlatanism, um, but there's some real stuff here to be had, and that's what um, I'm excited about. So, you take rats and um, do a hepatectomy and transplant with a reduced size liver, a little bit like you would do with a living donor liver. And you might want to do it in somebody who has rapid liver failure from acute on chronic alcoholism. And the so model is the alcohol fed rats. And so at the time of transplant, when the liver is taken out and the new one is put in, in either group, um, at that point, the alcohol ingestion stops, and the control and alcohol fed, previously alcohol fed rats are treated normally for the rest of the time. And you can see what a disaster occurs in this transplanted liver in the rats previous alcohol fed with a great deal of fibrosis. And um, you can also see that a fibrosis precursor, which is hardly evident in the control animals that heal up fine, um, and in I didn't mention that the recipients are GFP positive so that you can identify which your cells coming from the recipient and sure enough, you have um, a whole lot of uh, stem cells now attempting to do the right thing but failing, causing the fibrosis. And the reason is that there are some DNA uh, damage from the previous alcohol feeding prior to the point of transplant. And it turns out that you can identify this 8-OHDG um, DNA damage adduct from, from uh, oxygenation of the DNA in the mitochondria, in the stem cells um, of the alcohol fed rat. And this um, damage is present far more in the stem cells from the alcohol fed rat. So this is an example, and this is still very theoretical, that a disease, in this case fibrosis after a liver transplant, uh, can be caused not because of something intrinsic in the organ, but because of something caused by abnormal stem cells. Um, and this is uh, part of the uh, interest in new biology that I think has arrived because of the work uh, that Dr. Sun has been doing. Um, so, thank you for your attention. Well, so you, you, you may also wonder about the fact that we've run long, and uh, what about that? So um, Tatiana Zagoric um, specializes in highlight videos. So, <laughs> so you, you're thinking, uh, well, who's ever going to watch a 70, 80 minute video? But she'll make it something wonderfully immersive for a few minutes. And, It'll be amazing. So I don't want you to have a kind of depressed feeling about hey, having been at the longest session you've ever been at recently. Are there any questions for either Dr. Burdick or Dr. Sun or me? Yes. Um, I came in when you were saying that pathology was about death, death, death. Uh, could you 
Yeah, so when, no, no, I was talking about the international classification of uh, diseases when it was when it was first begun in 1871 at London's Crystal Palace. And at that time, it, that classification was all about death. There isn't any question. It does, it, it's not anything about today. I was, talking about, I was talking about then, the way that began. And here we are beginning something else. Tissue engineering pathology, you, you won't find that term in any journal or book in, anywhere in the world, and we plan in 2018 to make it a household word. So we're, we're beginning something, and the question is how, how do you begin something? And I thought our philosophy is to tie it to life rather than death. Well, I kind of have concerns about that messaging because pathology has always been about the study of disease and the whole autopsy, everything that built us up to here was based on the work that was done by the very earliest of people to build that understanding. Right. And this whole fibrotic concept is not unique, obviously, to this, but we see it a lot in lung, and there are some common pathways, and the, but it's all built on that stuff. And every day that we do anatomic pathology is about prolonging life and right. classifying disease as accurately as we can to make sure they get the right treatments, whether it's actually chemo or not, or antibiotics because we found an organism. So I think right. one should be careful with the language that we use because it's already an underserviced Yeah, specialty. so we, we have a lot of time for care. The reviewers of this paper, um, I, I was predicting what we do in the next eight years. They wanted me to predict up to 10. So I said that we'll have the classification absolutely balanced in all respects and everything solved and operational basically by 2028, 20, which gives <laughs> some time to work. So I welcome not only your, your ideas, but everybody else's. It's, it's very exciting that stem cell and the reduction of fibrosis, because once you get that down, it's so applicable to so many organ systems. So it's okay. wonderful. And exciting, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for a great talk. I, I just wondered, looking at your work using the Plex4 and the FK506, why does FK506 improve the uptake into the tissues? Because historically, certainly when I think of the use of FK506 in calcineurin inhibition in a kidney, I think of it as a prophorotic thing and long term type So, why is this? helping your healing? Why does it get itself? Well, like actually, I made a bad mistake in, in, in my talking about it because I was referring to Charlie's talk yesterday. It's very low-dose FK506, and yeah. it's an interesting story how that came. But it's usually a ratio. The AMD is used to talk. I mean, it's used to the maximum, a plateau, as much release of stem cells as possible. But the FK506 is usually 1 tenth to 1 40th or so. Of, of the amount of AMD 3100, that is below 10 percent, usually in the range of what, 3 to 10 percent, shall we, of, of immunosuppressive dosage. So, it, and in fact, if you use cyclosporin, you know, or high dose FK506, it prevents the process just as you would have expected. Yeah. And I didn't say low dose FK506, so that was a mistake. But why does that? So, oh, does that I go ahead. <laughs> That. Thank you for asking this interesting question. So uh, we kind of serendipitously discovered these uh, synergies between uh, uh, stem cell mobilizing drug AMD 700 and low dose FK. The original idea to, to reduce the immunosuppressive drug FK506 to a low dose because in our transplantation models, we want to convert severe acute rejection into a moderate rejection, so we have a chance to allow host stem cell come in to repopulate regen rejecting organs. So that was our original idea. But indeed, we found the synergy between AMD 7100 and FK5, low dose FK56 is to increase the recruitment of stem cells into the injured organs. Okay, this is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. And we further had, we are collaborating with uh, other investigators in, in the FK field. 
So we, we found actually if you give that very low dose tacrolimab FK56, actually the function nothing related to FKBP binding, nothing related to cutting inhibitors. So that low dose actually cannot block cutting uh, channels. So um, I, many studies are undergoing, but in summary, I think we believe the low dose FK has some unique functions through uh, probably unidentified, unidentified signal pathways, not cutting your inhibitor. So that's what we are we found, and we are continuing to study that. Because take a look back the history about discovery of tacrolimers. It was supposed to find a drug for killing the fungus. Mm -hmm. And uh, accidentally they found, oh, this drug can suppress T-cell proliferations and then develop uh, as an immunosuppressive drugs. I suspect that the investigators during that time, when they studied this exciting you know, immunosuppressive functions, they never test the low dose functions. They want to find, oh, what's the maximal, probably optimal dosage for immune suppression. So somehow, I think probably they missed some functions at the low dose. So uh, we kind of uh, happen find something kind of unique. So that's, uh, that's the start. Another thing I can tell you that um, we found if you give low dose FK alone, actually you can increase SDF1 stroma uh, stroma cell derived factor one, which uh, a champion for stem cells in the injured organs. And, but we don't know why, but that's uh, some kind of findings we have. So we also, yeah, sorry, it's, it's a little bit analogous to nano technology in general where you know very tiny particles or something have a completely different effect from exactly the same substance in a kind of macro form. So th this is a little bit like that. It's, it's surprising and very promising. But, but we test the cyclone also. Yeah. High dose or low dose doesn't work. So it's yeah. unique to epidotics. Yeah, that's what we found. Yeah. Thanks. So I just wanted to call the session to a close. I know students have some other things they have to go to. So thank you very much all for attending. If you'd like to stay behind and ask some questions of our guests today, that would be fabulous. So thank you for joining and thank you for a wonderful presentation.